Hi kids, it's Daddy. Adu. <laughs> yeah, look, we're at the we're at the cabin. We're at the lake, and this is one of my favorite spots on the whole planet. Adu. And all the way back behind there, you can see a place called Pickerel Point. And that's where I've caught all of my biggest fish in my life. I've caught so many fish: walleye, pike, suckers, perch. I've had lots of lessons here and learned a lot about myself. And had a lot of fun. I love you both so much. I'll do anything for you and I hope, I hope for a really long time that we'll be able to come here. I hope you have, uh, having fun watching this. And look, my hair's gone. <laughs> yeah, and now you have my hat. <laughs> you took my hat, you silly goose. I love you so much. Daddy. Yeah, Daddy's hat. You want to put it on? Put on Daddy? Yeah, thank you, Liana. Okay, I love you guys. Bye-bye. Okay, and where should I look? Look at Andrew. So, name? Uh, uh, Christopher Sargent, uh, uh, but I usually go by Chris, C H R I S. You're 39? Yeah, 39 years old. So, I was, I was born at the U of A hospital, um, and, and, and I live about 500 meters from the U of A hospital, so I like to joke about that I've gone, gone pretty far in life. <laughs> um, I've been married for almost five years now to my wife Sophia. And we have a, a, a daughter who's uh, it's a little over two, uh, Juliana is her name. So how I met my wife, I think it's a, I think it's a cool story. I love to, to travel, I just really got the, the travel bug. One of the fellows that I worked with in 2006, we thought we want to go to Brazil and Argentina. This is where our next destination is. And so we started planning with the trip and Sophie, so my wife now, she was working in tourism at the time in Argentina and she was one of the people I reached out to. And you know, I was sending out my itinerary, proposed itineraries, thoughts, what do you think about this place versus this, how should we spend our time? And we went to Brazil and went to Argentina. We never ended up visiting her, so I didn't meet her. At some point after getting back, I, I remember emailing her and just thanking her and sending some pictures, and then we just started writing. And uh, we, we hit it off, and they, I'd never seen a picture of her, and then we started sharing pictures of our lives, and I was like, wow, she's, she's pretty attractive. This is, this is kind of cool. And um, I get along really well with my mom. So, she said, next time you want to go on a trip, let me know and we'll do something together. And we flew down to Argentina together. And so I made sure this time that we stopped in Sophie's area. So the very first time I met Sophie in person was walking out of the gate, I guess you could say, or the arrivals, and there she was uh, with my mom on my side. So it was pretty, kind of crazy. <laughs> you know, and I, and I thought she was even cuter in real life. And it was like, this is cool. And we really hit it off together. It was, it was pretty magical. Um, but when we parted ways, we, uh, this is going to be impossible to keep up. I thought that he was perfect, but too far away. I think it was more like, well, I hope I can meet someone like her closer to home. I never thought that it could work because Canada and Argentina is a bit of a, a far stretch for dating. I need to find a guy like Chris, like here. It's kind of where, where we left it, I guess, and it was pretty sad to be apart, but just knew it wasn't going to work. In 2013, I was working internationally and I had a conference in Barcelona. And on that same exact same time window, her brother, who was living in Madrid at the time, was having a birthday party and she decided that she was going to go celebrate her brother's birthday in Madrid. And so it was just by pure luck, I guess, um, providence or uh, I'm not sure the right word, but we were in Spain at the same time and we decided we have to, we have to meet again. We met in Barcelona. We spent hours in La Sagrada Familia in the chapel in Barcelona and there we just spent I think four or six hours just talking about faith and what it meant to us and he said we should make this work. I told him like you know what let's not make promises you cannot keep. Let's have fun now and and figure out the rest. I'll believe you when I see you in Argentina. And because I was working internationally I had some flexibility within my schedule as to where I could work from. Um, so that spring, the spring, it was this, uh, the spring of 2013, I was able to visit Argentina quite a few times. And then he came to Argentina. And we met and kind of never been apart since. It was, it was, it was pretty awesome. And we got married the um, following March in 2014. We got married in the Catholic, on, I guess under the Catholic Church. And one of the, the promises I made to the priest 
in Argentina, that's where I married in Argentina, was that I would learn more about Roman Catholicism. Um, I didn't promise him that I would become Catholic. I didn't feel that was an appropriate promise. Um, but I did promise him that we would raise our kids in a Roman Catholic household. From, for many years, the one thing that's is, I've always thought is if I don't, I shouldn't have strong opinions about things that are complex and things that I don't understand. <laughs> and so I've always just, um, I guess, been very interested, m probably more so in spirituality. I've had a, a really strong connection to, to nature and to the outdoors throughout my life. And I've often felt, I guess you could say, in touch with God or in touch with something more transcendent when I'm out in my canoe at a, at a cabin. He was always really spiritual, but he couldn't, he didn't have a channel for that. He felt close to God in nature. So that was easy to handle with Chris. But when we got married, we made a promise to a priest to raise the kids in the Catholic faith. And that was important to me because I have a strong faith. So I wanted to give my kids that. And Chris was open-minded with that. He adapts to a lot of things. And I think that's how he has been handling this so well because he tends to adapt well to things. The place was good. We had a new, relatively new daughter, about one and a half. We're filming today in the condo that I've been living in for about 11 years now, and we were really actively looking for a, to buy a house, very much planning to grow our family. Um, things were good. Things were really good. We'd been traveling a lot, and we did a backpacking trip in BC. Um, was planning for a half marathon. I've been doing some really interesting work at Alberta Health on the opioid crisis. Sophie had just uh, said yes to a, a new job. So life was really moving in a good way. I had some minor pain for a couple of days and, and, and we're, we're still on holidays and I just basically went across the street to see a, a walk-in clinic and within the next day I had an ultrasound, I thought maybe I had some gallstones. So that was one of the hardest moments of my life, I guess, was doing that ultrasound. Um, because the tech was looking and looking and looking and very silent and I was saying, have you seen anything in the gallbladder? She said, no, I'm not seeing much in the gallbladder, but she kept looking and, and then she left. She said, I have to go talk to the radiologist and she left and she was gone for quite a while and then her and the radiologist came in together and then he looked for quite a while and he said, are you, are you healthy? Like, are you, are you, how are you feeling these days? And, I'm fine. I just came back from a big hiking trip. We actually done two hiking trips in the previous two weeks. Um, backpacking trips, you know, carrying our, our tents and stoves and sleeping bags, everything. And he said, you're, you know, you're not, you're not more tired. Have you lost any weight lately? I said, no, not at all. Just, just some tenderness here, but that's, that's it. Otherwise, I've been fine. He said, okay. He said, well, it's not your gallbladder. It's your liver. And he said, I think you need to talk to your family doc more. And that was it. And it was quite shocking to me. Um, I guess the, the radiologist must have immediately called my family doctor. Um, my family doc called me himself and said, you need to come in. Um, so he said, I have a slot this afternoon. Can you come in this afternoon? And that was on the, that was on the 14th. And so that was it. That was that. And that's all I knew. And I went to my parents. I was just in kind of shock. Um, and all I could tell them was something to do with my liver. And with the urgency of how they've acted, it must be serious. And so thoughts of cancer came into my mind right away. So it was quite, quite devastating, but, but no information really, no clarity. And that afternoon, my wife and I went to see the, the family doc, and that's when he told me that I have metastases on my liver, a number of them, some of them large. Um, and he said, you need a CT scan. And he said it's most likely cancer, but he couldn't, couldn't guarantee that or couldn't, for any level of certainty, specify. Um, just, and it's been this way, unfortunately, throughout the cancer, where it's just bad news and the next thing of more bad news and the next thing of more bad news. Um, that's been hard to take. So this, the CT scan was worse than, because it showed things in the lungs and lymph nodes, and it really gave a clear idea of the, the scale of what's going on in my liver. You know, I was hoping for, um, I never hoped for this, but I was, I was hoping for a lymphoma or uh, maybe colon cancer, something with better outcomes. Um, but I was given a diagnosis of a cancer that's it's almost exclusively fatal and it works pretty fast. And it wasn't until September 7th that I got the, we're quite certain it's cholangiocarcinoma or also known as bile duct cancer. Mm -hmm. 
you read stories about people, some, some people who have this and die within a few weeks or of being diagnosed. And you read other stories of people who get the treatment I was getting and, and their cancer shrunk a lot and then surgery was an option for them. I was told right from the beginning this is incurable and inoperable. Um, and our best hope is to manage it for, for some time. Um, it's hard to, he said, it's really hard to, to know what your life expectancy is, but median life expectancy with treatment is about 11 months. I've always had this, this feeling, right, from a really young age that I'll live a long time. Quite a few members of our family that have lived, um, live really long lives. I've always been cognizant of uh, you know, things you should do to, to live a long time in terms of eating well and regular physical activity. Um, so for me this was a huge shock, a huge shock. It's still hard to wrap my head around. And I wasn't having symptoms. Um, I wasn't um, you know, fatigued or weight loss or in lots of pain, those kind of things that cancer patients might have for quite a while before being diagnosed. At the beginning, when we first got the diagnosis, I was really angry because I couldn't understand it all. And to be honest, right now, I still can't. And even my mom was, my mom is, she has a strong faith and she, she's, um, she has been my lucky charm through everything. And she kept calling me and saying, like, you should pray. I'm like, I'm not praying. I'm mad at God right now. And she, she told me, you should not be mad at God. And I'm like, I get mad with my dad. And that's fine. I think God can handle it right now. So I, I got angry. I got super angry and I didn't want to pray. I didn't want to talk. I didn't want to think about it. I think it was also part of denial. Like, no, we'll figure this out. We'll, this is probably a mistake. But then everything kind of settled and I could find my way. And I think after all the noise went away, I could be more calm. Like how you, you're a brand new father. This yeah. Ha this happens. Yeah. Um, you're sitting there with your wife. Um, how do you? What happens? That, like how do you wrap your? You know, yeah. What you know what? This is happening. You know what's the really strange thing? I don't think I would be too scared about dying, if if I didn't have children, and didn't have Sophie. I've lived a really full life, and I'm. I'm proud of the life that I've lived. And I've had a lot of really cool experiences and I've gotten to, to do a lot of the things that were important to me. But now my life is about being a father and raising my family and providing those experiences for my kids. And, and so I just like the last thing I want to do right now is to not be there. So for me to get that diagnosis, it almost seemed absurd. Like a, like this can't be real and like I said I still have a hard time wrapping my head around it but um, I feel it and I know it's there and I'm a very different person than I was eight months ago. Can you give daddy a hug? Can you give daddy a big hug? Oh. Where's daddy's kiss? Bravo daddy. Bravo daddy. Can you give me a kiss? Best of daddy. Oh. Now the one thing that happened concurrently with all this was I found out my wife was pregnant. And it was, it was just mind blowing. I, I told Sophie when she told me she was pregnant, you know, how do you, how do you feel? She was, and I felt like, like my cup is already kind of overflown with emotion or just like, it's like, I don't know if I have any more emotion, but it was such a joy um, to have that, to have that positive news, to have that life affirming, like that life is growing. Um, news and in some ways I consider it a bit of a miracle as well because we certainly wouldn't have started to try to grow our family after I was diagnosed with chemo or with cancer after I had started chemo those things just wouldn't have been possible um, so there was a pretty narrow window for Sophie to to become pregnant and, and it happened it was pretty interesting uh, I said to everybody it happened in a good timing, like we found out that he had cancer, and then we found out that I was pregnant, because it would have happened the other way around. 
we would be saying, oh my God, why this happens now? But we found out that he had cancer and then I found out that I was pregnant. So we thought the thinking was, that's such a joy. What a miracle, what an incredible thing to happen right now. Uh, and we were really happy to have Lucia coming uh, in that timing. It gave him a milestone and it gave us a positive in all this midst of problems that we had. And even now, Julianne is so excited about her sister coming, the baby coming, and she's kissing the belly and touching it. So there's a lot of joy. It's a strange, it's a really strange time to have um, so much joy with, with a young daughter and a growing family. And you know, I took Julianne skating yesterday for the first time in her life. And I just, ever, you know, exploring the world with her and having a new baby imminently, yet being in, in, a, in, a, in a place where I don't know if I'm going to pass away next week, or it could be two years from now. I don't, I don't know. But yeah, it's it's it's, it's very it's very hard. And 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 for me, ninety five percent of the hard the hardship is the impact that this has on other people. Like that's what keeps me up at night. That's what makes me frustrated, and that's what makes me angry, and that's what um, challenges me to accept this. Is thinking about my daughters. I haven't even met one of them yet, but my daughter's not growing up with a dad. I mean, there's a lot going on, but at the same time, there's a lot less going on in a way because, yeah, I'm going to appointments, I'm going to chemo, um, but every every day, otherwise, I would have been at work for eight hours. And you have a lot of time to think and. I think when you're, at least for me, when you're a teenager and uh, maybe into your into your twenties, you say maybe you feel like you have all the answers, but it, maybe you don't feel like you need to have more answers, or, or you don't feel a lot of uncertainty about the way the world is. Um, I've always been a very, I guess, a very rational person interested in, in science, and, I, and I'm still very passionate about the scientific process. And um, so, I guess for me, there wasn't a place of desire for God in, in that way. Just things made sense and I didn't maybe feel like I needed more, but I, I think through, once we had Juliana, our, our, our first daughter, we baptized her in the Roman Catholic Church in Argentina. And I've just become more and more, I guess, intrigued by the church and, and wanting to learn more as, as we have committed to raising our family, Roman Catholic. I felt it was a, incumbent on me to, to learn more about the faith and and what it means, and the more I've learned, the more it's drawn me in. I really love this area. This is, I used to play hockey here quite a bit. And, uh, I haven't played this year because of cancer. So we have the final game of the year tomorrow night. I might lace them up tomorrow night, I think, just to, really? just to get out. It might be pretty slow, and not take many shifts, but uh, it would be good to join the guys one, one time this year. So. What time? It's seven o'clock. <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I have enough to. I have enough explaining to do for not showing up for the year. <laughs> I don't need a film crew in tow. <laughs> but I don't have much to show on the ice either, so I'd rather not film it. <laughs> this is an awkward, you know, someone falling around with a camera. No, it, you know, it feels good. It's good for the ego. You know? <laughs> we had been going to mass more in, in in the spring and into the summer, and I was feeling very comfortable with the Catholic Church and. Deacon Guy, I think is his name, when he delivered um, one, of his re one of the readings, he talked about not leaving things to the 11th hour and 55th minute, I think was this. And I thought, and here I am at church and at mass, and, and it, I felt like a fraud a little bit. Like, I really am leaving this for the 11th hour and 55th minute. Now, it wasn't that I was raised Catholic and I just had strayed from the faith. So my exposure had been a bit different than some people, but Sometimes I guess when you're when you're faced with something that's so fundamentally hard to understand, it's just such cognitive dissonance about because you feel healthy and you look in the mirror and even all my blood work was fine. A lot of my blood work is still fine now. Like it's 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 but yet I you know you can see what's going on. You can feel it. This 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 is more two things in the world. And the faith is important to my wife and I see that I know how I want our family to live its life and if I can help set that foundation for our family then I'm gonna do that but also also for myself too like I, it's not just oh 
okay, I want to do this just to cover my bases or cover my bets, hedge my bets, you know, <laughs> like you hear people sometimes say that, well, why not kind of thing, but it, it just spoke to me. I don't know, I, I don't know how to say it in a better way. It's just something that's, it just, I, I wanted to spend more time with, with Father Joby. I, I wanted to spend more time with JD. I had so many questions. I started reading the Bible a lot and it just, it resonated. Today's lesson is going to focus on on marriage and the Catholic vision for what marriage is. Uh, it's our fifth wedding anniversary on Friday. But I'm quite pleased because when I talked to Sophie a little while ago about Friday, she said, what's Friday? What's... <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of regret almost just not letting it happen and then surprising her with some gifts. And <laughs> so I actually didn't meet Chris until almost December, but I think the first time I heard about him was in like October 2018. And uh, one of our deacons here, Deacon Michael, uh, was telling us that he had a young man approach him who was uh, interested in becoming Catholic and being baptized, but that he was suffering from cancer and that they didn't know if he would be here till Easter. One of the first meetings I had with Chris, I was like, would you like a cup of coffee? You know, he's like, oh, sure. And I said, oh, we're out of milk right now. We just have like this creamer or like whitener, you know? And he goes, oh no, that might cause cancer, you know? Like, so right away, like he's just kind of a, he's a fun guy to be around. Um, He's a deep thinker, like you can tell he, he thinks about things very critically. I think I had a little bit of uh, skepticism a little bit at first because, you know, here's somebody that uh, we don't know in the parish and somebody says, oh, I'm, I'm coming and I'm dying and, you know, I was just kind of like, okay, well, I don't know, like, let's see, you know, but like, you know, when I met him, it was, it was obvious like he was going through his chemo treatments and stuff and it was like okay and like as soon as he starts asking some questions and i got to know him a little bit it's like no this guy's serious like this is the real deal i guess for quite a long time i've never had a a set maybe a set perspective about what what organized religion means or or what it is i've always known it's it's been something that's helpful for people um but it hasn't frankly it hasn't it hadn't appealed to me in the past um when i had gone to uh, different types of Christian denominations. I guess I had maybe the feeling that it was often more about uh, about money and we need a new parking lot or we need a new gym and I never really understood just ask Jesus into your heart. And I often felt like some of the places I went to that was that was all you had to do was just ask Jesus into your heart and all will be forgiven and it didn't didn't appeal to me that much because I felt like there's there needs to be more to faith than just just asking Jesus into your heart. And, and for me, I, I needed um, I needed an intellectual connection with with what's going on, a rational connection, uh, a connection that's, that's something that's a bit more tangible in my own life, plus a, a, a deeper understanding, I guess, intellectually of the history of the faith and what are its its foundations, what are its roots. I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this, but like, you know, that very first session that we had with him at RCIA, it's, it was on the the death and resurrection of Jesus, and he just like right away said like this is the area that I have the biggest questions. This is the area that I don't understand, like he says, and really like Jesus, like he says, you know, this is the area I have the most questions. It was almost urgent. It was like, I, I need to know this now. Like, I, I need to know, was Jesus' resurrection real? I need to know this, like, you know, things like that. And it's, people don't have that kind of same urgency, that same like hunger and thirst for this knowledge. If they're not in it 100%. I picked the, the Gospel of Luke and I said, just start reading. Like, this is what you're going to do like for homework is you're just going to start reading the Gospel and getting to know Jesus and praying to him and asking him to, to help you in your faith and stuff. And it just grew from that. When I was diagnosed, I didn't even want to think about uh, getting through the winter because that was August at the time. I was really focused on meeting baby Lucia, um, but it was also something that I, I prayed for a lot and really didn't know if it would come true or not. So mm -hmm. I still don't know if that's the case, but uh, we're about a month away from having, having Lucia and it seems more and more real every day. I've never got the impression that he's doing it to please his wife, not at all. Uh, that's never even kind of come up in any sort of way. 
I would say though that maybe there is a part of this for his children and that's absolutely correct to do, right? Like as a father, your job is to pass on the faith to your children. How can you pass on what you don't have? He struck me as a smart man right away. Definitely as someone who is, uh, who, was, who is and who was like searching and looking for meaning, but like real meaning. And like, it was important to him that we really get this right, you know? Um, he didn't want it to be wishy-washy stuff. Like he wanted it like the real substance and we, we gotta get this right. And St. Augustine said, we all wanna live happily. In the whole human race, there's no one who does not assent to this proposition, even before it is fully articulated. He also said, how is it then that I seek you, Lord? Since in seeking you, my God, I seek a happy life, let me seek you so that my soul may live. For my body draws life from my soul, and my soul draws life from you. And St. Thomas Aquinas, in his succinct way, says, God alone satisfies. The Beatitudes reveal that the goal of human existence, the real ultimate end of human acts, is that God, God calls us to his own beatitude, his own blessing. And, um, the more I dig in, in, into the Bible and the, and the words of Christ, I don't find that it's in conflict with for the vast majority of, of what I've read and what I've come across, even the accounts of Christ's resurrection and the existence of Christ as uh, something more than just a human being. They, they, they seem to be very strong in corroborating that those things happened. They weren't things that are made up or metaphorical. And I also think the scientific process and the scientific kind of journey that humanity's on really is, is more about revealing what God has created. Like it's, it's not at odds with it. And I think, it's, I think it's quite ignorant to think that the two would be at odds. And I felt that in the past, but it, for me, that's largely just because I didn't have enough information to base my opinions on. It stems back to the notion that we are not just biological. We're not just physical beings but we are a totality, a duality of spirit and body. And the Catholic Church looks at it that these are not things that should be separated. Some of the qualities I, I get of the Catholic Church that I, I didn't find elsewhere that for me were very appealing, the tradition for me. Like I, I said, I'm a fairly rational person and to be able to be part of something that's you know, effectively been happening almost since the time of Christ is it's really reassuring, you know, whether it's in Edmonton or all over North America or even globally, there's churches that spring up and close all the time. There's all sorts of different things that are happening within, within Christianity. And I, I think you should be pretty particular about what you're choosing and discern, discerning. And it's something you need to test out and try. And I, from the times that I've been in attending Mass and, and meeting individuals involved with Roman Catholicism, it's just, it's, I felt at home. And I think it's because of the, the traditions. I think also because of this, it's such a large faith group. And for me, that means it's constantly being challenged and tested. When you have such a, a large faith group, to me, it just it reassures me that it's something that's been around for a long time. It's going to be around for a long time and it, and it can't stagnate. Globally, the, the mass, I mean, the mass that I'm having in Edmonton is very similar to the mass that's happening in the Philippines or in Africa or in Latin America on that same day each year. It's, it's wonderful to have that connection to people around the world. I, I like the humbleness of the, that I see in Mass and the, that connection to the past. It just there's so many things I could, I mean, I could go on for quite a while, but so many things that are, have been appealing to me about the Roman Catholic faith from someone from the outside. And then being diagnosed with cancer, it really, it really sped things up in terms of it, my own desire to, to, to become Catholic, to be part of the Catholic family to have our family unified under one faith, to be baptized. You know, the question of whether he's, you know, coming to faith to kind of like cover his basis, you know, like go to heaven instead of going to hell, that sort of thing. Um, he actually kind of brought that up and really um, it was more of one of his concerns, one of his, um, I almost want to say like maybe even a temptation in a sense, right? Like in terms of criticizing himself, like how will others view this? Maybe they'll think I'm a hypocrite or maybe they'll think that I'm not a smart or educated person or things like that. And, but he was true to what he's doing. 
But, you know, maybe there are people out there who think that, oh, yeah, well, you know, belief in God is just kind of for, like, those uneducated people that don't understand, you know, the realities of the world or something. And, you know, maybe faced with death, he's coming to this, you know, just because he's scared or something. And it's like, I, I really don't think so. I, I, think, I think Chris is actually very wise. I think he has a wisdom that actually kind of goes beyond this world in a sense. Hey, have a good evening. Thanks. 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 See you on Sunday. Sunday, 10.30. Have a good evening. It's pretty warm in there. Yeah, that was the topic of sexuality too. When I met people, <laughs> <laughs> blush. And... When Ryan was going through his, uh, his kind of lists of what's good and bad and distortions and self-giving and total love, I was kind of thinking that's a lot to think about during sex. <laughs> it's a bit distracting, maybe. But... It's important, important academically, intellectually. There's different ways to approach life. And I feel that in my life, there's a, a calling, a craving for deep happiness, for satisfaction, for connection. There's nothing material or there's nothing earthly that fulfills that, or fully fulfills that. I, I guess I've come to realization that you can kind of either be constantly trying to fill that hole through, you know, for me, I was doing a lot of travel. Uh, I love fishing, I love all, you know, there's all these things that give me pleasure, but don't always give you maybe a deeper fulfillment, sense of fulfillment or satisfaction. Well, maybe we are meant to have satisfaction. Maybe we are meant to be deeply fulfilled. And if those earthly things aren't, aren't providing that fulfillment, that satisfaction, what does? You know? And that's, I think, where the spiritual life comes in, where faith comes in, mm -hmm. um, and where where Christ comes in, his, his story, and how he sacrificed for us. For me, it's something that resonates, and I think it's something that his life and his teachings um, and his crucifixion and resurrection are something that are very plausible. Um, things that I can believe in, and the offering that Christ has of redemption um, and love, it's really compelling. And it's something I don't find in other faiths, is, to be his parent. Even with the cancer diagnosis, I haven't experienced a lot of anger. But I, yeah, I get frustrated, for sure. Um, especially when I think about my daughters and not being there for them. But you say, how do I deal with that? Um, I get prayer, for sure, is, is really helpful. Um, having faith, that there's a lot more to their lives than just me and that God can provide. Sometimes when these things happen, maybe this is about God sparing you from something much worse. Or you sacrificing to enable others to do, to do good, or to um, go beyond maybe what they could have otherwise. So I do have faith that this is part of something much larger than me too. Um, and this is something I need to accept. Um, and maybe it's, maybe there's many goods that are coming out of this too. Oh. So, I just have to understand that there's things at work that are much bigger than, than my own hopes and desires sometimes. And that this is for the best. So, are you still watching there. the Oilers? Yeah. Yeah, well, you talk about angry. <laughs> That's maybe one place I get angry. <laughs> this might be my last season of watching NHL hockey and I have to be so bad. <laughs> Well, they've stopped me on chemo now because um, it hasn't been working. This continued disease progression um, within the liver. The cancer in the liver keeps growing, and that's, that's the, what the cancer that will kill me. Um, so they're looking at other approaches now. And so I'm going to be entering into a clinical trial in Calgary. Well, yesterday I went to watch my um, niece run in the, at the Butterdome in the running room games they have. On the, it's a track meet for elementary kids. I was watching her run, and they... The running room was handing out magazines, and I've been, been an avid runner for quite a few years now. And I'm just reading, last night in bed, I was going through the different articles. And I was livid, like thinking, 
this is a life I, this was me, this is my life, and now I'm sick and I can't do those things, I can't plan for those races, I can't plan for... Daddy! <laughs> Hello? Daddy, Hi, sweetie pie. We have, we have some friends here. Howdy, Hello? Hi, monkey pie. Daddy! Yeah? Oh, your buttons. Okay, let's do your boots. We have Matt and Andrew here. Hi. So our friends. Yeah, can you say hi? Hi. Hi, yeah. They're here to learn more about us and more about our life. Did you have a good day? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> do you want to have some food? Are you hungry? Yeah. What do you want? Hi. You, you want to give me a hug? Can you give Daddy a kiss? Oh, love you so much. You want to take off your socks? Yeah. Yeah, let's take off your socks. But, um... Right from the start, my my dad was very, he's devastated. And and I wouldn't say pessimistic, but um, realist, I guess, about this. And he's he's seen this as, you know, his son's passing away. And that's, he's been awesome. He's been incredible. They done everything in, in their power and more, I feel like, to, to make this comfortable and to support us and to, to be there for us. My mom, been much more of an optimist. She sees this as something to get through. It's nice to have both sides of it because I can be very open about my dad about what I want to have happen after I'm gone kind of thing. Whereas my mom doesn't entertain those conversations. Mommy. But it's also wonderful to have someone who's like, Mommy. we're getting through this, like that's Mommy. not a question. I often find myself apologizing. Maybe it's a Canadian thing, I'm not sure, but apologizing for you know, not, potentially not being around. And I feel quite a bit of guilt about that. Um, but for Juliana to just, for her and for Lucia, I don't ever want them to feel like I abandoned them. Um, and then for them to know how, how tremendously difficult it is to think about not being with them, because they're the greatest source of joy in my life. Is this, is this on? Is it on? Is it is on? Yeah. Okay. Just... <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Shake, 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 shake. Can you move? If you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it, if you're happy and you know it. Shake! Have you got enough? <laughs> All done. Do you want to go on this one? Let's go. Nan, let's go on this one. This one's, a, this one's, look at all the water at the bottom. Let's. Okay. One, two, three, two. Dad. Whoa! Is she, is she, is she moving? <laughs> yeah, she was. I uh, thank God it's getting close. I'm so big. It's been awesome. I haven't had any any issues, any tiredness or anything. So I'm super happy. When I tell this story to somebody that we just met or to a taxi driver, it sounds awful. It sounds like a soap opera. Like and 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 he's dying and I'm pregnant and his mom broke his leg. So I'm sorry about, but every single day has its blessing. Like every single day, is, uh, we've, there's happiness to be found, and um, the kids are a joy. But even you not know, the kids, everything is everything is beautiful in spite of this. Hey, I'm gonna get you! <laughs> I'm gonna get you! <laughs> for me, and I, I maybe extrapolate for others, but when I got that diagnosis and continue along this path, it became really simple as to what's important. Oh! Where do you want to go? Look at that, chop chop. I want, I've never hiked in Nepal. I've hiked in some of the Himalayas in India, but I've never hiked in Nepal, and it's something I've always wanted to do, and I wanted to go to Bhutan too, in, in the Himalayas. And I'd, I've never gone scuba diving in, in some of the, the places in the South Pacific, and I'd love to do that. But every second I'm doing that, I'm not with my family, and it's, really become clear as to what's important to me and that's time with my family and being with your family is not always fun you're changing diapers and the dishwasher and you're tired and what, what have you this is sophie's mom is coming uh, next week as well oh, yeah. and just to have her have her here when the snow is gone and it's just 10 degrees and sunny and stuff it's just easier on her awesome yeah yeah easier easier on all of us yeah for sure Hi. you want to come down <laughs> I got you. <laughs> One, two, three. Oof. Yeah, grab some chips. It's 
It's a nice jacket. It's mine. <laughs> I don't fit in my jacket. Does, does this one zip up? I don't want to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> don't. <laughs> don't try. You survive. Say bye bye, Jack. Oh. Welcome back. We're going to go home and eat. You say bye bye. As I got to know Chris, and you know, like I would say, we kind of became friends. Like we we both like the outdoors and fishing and things like that. And I think we can connect well on an intellectual level. Like so, we've kind of like grown this friendship. There's lots of good moments and laughing and all this sort of stuff. But there's kind of like you know this in the background. Like yeah, there's a tumor growing. Like it's so yeah, it's a bit of a you know ups and downs. Chris hasn't shared with us a lot of his suffering. You know, um, he's always put on a very brave face. Uh, he always comes looking, you know, energized and chipper and things like that. But, um, you know, his wife kind of shares, like you kind of get a little bit of a different picture from her in a sense. And I know she, she approached me and she said, JD, like we had a really scary week, you know, like Chris couldn't get up and things like this. And she says, how do I baptize him if I need to? And I said, okay, I said, if it comes to that, I said, you get water and you say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But I said, I'm also going to give you Father's phone number, his cell phone, I'm going to give you my cell phone number. And I said, can you phone us immediately and we'll come day or night, you know? So yeah, there was a question of like, yeah, maybe we should just do this sooner than later and, um, you know, get him baptized. But as I, got to know him um, and spent a little bit more time with him I really had this feeling like no we're we're making it to Easter like this is happening at Easter and it was just kind of a strong feeling like it, it was just a confidence that's like no this isn't something we have to worry about So it's been it's been a long time in the, in the in in coming in terms of going through the RCIA course. Yeah, it was it was a long build up, and I I was unsure when I started the course. I mean, I didn't know if I would be around or not. Do we accelerate this? Uh, do we move the baptism up just for just to ensure that I'll be both around and, and also healthy enough to participate? But after the conversations and seeing where things were at, I I had faith that. I, I want to go through it properly and, and that I will be there to do it properly. I was pretty relieved, I have to say, to be able to just, just to be there, just to physically be around and to be present. That was, that was important for me, that was a big deal for me. And part of me was nervous about, will I have the energy to sustain myself through the evening? But I, I, was, I think I was running on, on kind of adrenaline and just excitement and passion. It was, it, I never had any doubts or hesitation about doing it. It was just a matter of, can I, can I handle it? Can I be present? Can I be engaged? And so the baptism itself, I guess it really reconfirmed uh, that this is the right thing to do and it's, it's a place for me. It felt like home. Christopher, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I was super proud. I'm still, I'm, uh, everybody in my hometown and in my family goes through 
the process of getting baptized without much knowledge. For him to choose to do it and go through the course and it was like a lot of work behind everything. I was really proud when it, it was all done. You can see from my face I had a huge smile. In a time of, of complete lack of clarity as to what's going on, and even, even to this day, like I said, I don't know if I'll pass away in a month or um, two years from now or ten years from now or so much uncertainty. And this is one of the few, really the only thing in my life that's been able to give me a level of, of peace and a level of clarity and a shelter from the storm. Christopher, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. With your spirit. It gave me strength. And then after, I, a lot of it was more around, I, I guess, gratefulness or thank, thankfulness, to be forgiven of sin, too. Like that's, that's something that was on my mind a lot. Um, I made some mistakes. Like we all have sinned and will continue to sin, but to be forgiven of sin and then to be washed clean is, is really powerful. And it's, if it's something that you can wrap your head around and accept, you feel loved and supported in ways that you haven't before. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. I, I take part in the Eucharist, and to me that's the zenith of the, of the Mass, and to have the, the flesh and blood of Christ, is, to, and, and to not have that when you're not baptized, and to go to church frequently and, 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 and to, to not be able to take part is um, something you want, something that I wanted. And to now to be able to do that each time, like for me, that was very, it's very fulfilling, and it's uh, it recharges me and sustains me. And I, I like to think that it heals and, and helps me with uh, with what I'm dealing with. And I mean, I don't know what life I have, but I I guess you. I mean, if you if you really believe, I don't think your life with the church or your relationship with Christ ends when you die. It's something that just continues on, regardless if you live to 800 or if you live, if you die at 40. It's it's irrelevant in terms of your relationship with God. I think. So she looks that? like you, huh? Hey? Yeah, yeah, I think she does a little bit. I told you! <laughs> because Monkey looks so much like Chris that I was certain that we were going to have a brunette and brown, out, brown eyes coming up and she looks exactly like Chris again. So I'm not disappointed. I love my kids. It was a bit of a roller coaster. I was really pregnant. <laughs> it was such a joy. Uh, but the first thing I started to look through is like, what does she have for mine? And nothing, absolutely nothing. Sophie was induced on, a, on Easter Monday, the two days after the baptism. I mean, she was incredibly bright red and, and slimy. I think... I, hello? Uh, we might have to answer that question again. Hi, Daddy's here. Daddy, come. Lucia Christie, yeah. Is that after Chris? Yes. He... He has been more emotional with all this, and we wanted to give Lucia a family name in the middle, but we couldn't find a family name that we liked or that we would work with his last name. So Christy came in the last week, and it worked perfectly, and she looks like Christy, so it's good. Yeah, it was, it was pretty emotional. It's a big milestone. I remember the first time I had a biopsy I asked the radiologist and I've asked a number of health providers, you know, about longevity and, and everyone was pretty loath to give me an answer, but I remember that one radiologist said, I'm confident you'll be, and he was looking with the ultrasound at my, at my liver, at the tumors at the time when I was, we were talking, and he said, oh, I'm confident you'll be there for the birth. And I didn't, they held on to that, I guess, and so that was a big deal for me to, to, to be there. Can you smile? Can you smile? Say hi. 
Can you say hi? hi. I think what struck me though is I'd been working so much to, I'm looking so forward just to being there and making that my milestone. I want to see her, I want to meet her. And then there was a bit of sadness with it. I think it was kind of bittersweet. Because then it's like, this is just the beginning. It's like, this isn't the end. This isn't, okay, I get to meet her, but I want a relationship with her. I want to be there. And so that's, that's the hardest part of this, without a doubt. And so that, that was a bit, of, a bit of a blow to me that I guess I wasn't expecting or hadn't really thought much about because I was so focused on getting to the birth. Just got so excited to see her. And I mean, that was pretty, pretty amazing to have the, the baptism and the birth of the child and just a couple of days apart from each other. And, and you know, you're really clearly kind of going towards those things. So that was, that was amazing. So I, don't, I can't replicate that again. Two births. Two births, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Me too. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. So yeah, I was, uh, that was a big deal for me was to, to make it to 40. So this is, this is kind of morbid, but I, I often thought if I pass away, I'd, I'd rather my, on my headstone, you know, at least, at least he lived to 40. He wasn't in his thirties, you know, he was a mid, truly middle-aged or something, you know, at 40. So, so I made it there. So that's something I've been struggling with a little bit now is, is what's the next milestone. So we're looking at a trip to Europe later in the summer, early fall. And so that's something I want to set as a milestone. How are you feeling? Uh, every day is different for sure. And even, even during the day, it's, it's different parts. Uh, so right now I'm feeling fairly well, t I'm tired. Um, the medication I'm on creates a lot of side effects. Probably since the end of March, I've lost about 15 pounds or so just no appetite um, and the, the, the fatigue and those kinds of things. So that just comes along with, almost aligns with when I started the drug, you know, that's, that's, those things came along. So yeah, I'd, I'd say I'd lend less well than I was uh, a few months ago, but um, yeah, very tired, very uh, lethargic, just, just uh, kind of like a, a battery on, mostly on empty. I had, uh, a CT scan after after eight weeks, and it was it was quite remarkable. It was it was just a few days after the baptism. Uh, it had shown that the majority of my tumors had shrunk on on the drug compared to the, the CT scans scans immediately prior to me starting the drug. So it showed a decrease there. But I had a CT scan yesterday, uh, so that was June 24th, and it showed that there were a lot of new tumors and some of the tumors had grown, and also that there was three spots in my spine too where there's cancer. So it's um, mixed, mixed results. I guess I was, today, yesterday, I was fairly disappointed to, to find out that there wasn't, the drug wasn't continuing to perform. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to know right now as to what's the, what's the best course going forward, so I'll, I'll have to meet with my oncologists. Um, one of the things they're afraid of with, uh, with where I'm at right now is um, loss of bone density and with, with having some of the cancer in the spine. Yeah. Um, Do you mind if I, if I... I'm feeling a little nauseous, sure. so I just want to take, take one pill. I'll come right back. So my milestones are a bit more mundane. For me, it's day to day, it's like I don't have many options. Right now, my two main concerns are to keep the baby alive and well, like to make sure that the diapers are changed, she doesn't have a diaper rash and all mundane things, uh, make sure that monkey is well taken care of and keep Chris encouraged because right now it's, that is super hard for him to find um, the will to wake up or stand up if with such a somber um, horizon. How do you do that? I don't have many options. I, I was praying for a miracle, longevity, and raising the kids together. But now with this new turn of events, I am praying for, okay, a good afterlife for everybody so we can meet again. And so it comes, it depends on the day. And it sounds simple, but it's, those three scenarios can happen in the same hour. So it changes. Where do you find that? 
I think it's God. I And to be honest, I think it's the Virgin Mary. I try to pray a lot because she went through uh, worst. So it's good for me to channel um, that role model and try to be that way. Even when we first got the diagnosis, I, sorry, I cry always when I say this, but I couldn't like, I couldn't get it. And it, it was impossible. It was surreal. He, he's so healthy. So um, the first words I came to my mind was what the Virgin said when she got announced that she was going to be pregnant, that she was pregnant and carrying the, she said, soy la esclava del Señor. I'm God's, I will be God's will. I don't know how to say it in English, but I know it in Spanish. Um, so she surrendered herself to his will. So I try to do that. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but I try to do that. If you want to film this one, this is me. <laughs> My laxative. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Restore it. Yes. I got it. Can you make a commercial hour of it? Pimiento? If I thought the interview was awkward, yeah. eating with a camera. I didn't film eating, yeah. Thank God it's not passed out, like really messy. Yeah, noodles. Yeah. Chicken wings. <laughs> well, I think there was just this kind of natural high that, that happened right around the baptism and the birth. That really helped cement my faith, I guess, or just strengthened it. But there have been times, even yesterday and today, when you get very negative results too. It's, I don't think it's made me question my faith, but it, it challenges my thinking about what God's plan is for me, I guess. In some ways, you know, I'd, I'd hoped for, for quite a while that, okay, maybe I have to go through a time of suffering, but there's a, a cure around the corner. Or there's, there's, there's something that's gonna kind of help me get out of this and, and praying will help with that. But I, I don't, and you get negative things and you don't think, okay, well, maybe it's not about that. And maybe there's not, uh, light at the end of the tunnel in terms of getting through cancer and getting past cancer. Maybe my story is different than that. But it doesn't, it doesn't shake my faith by any stretch. It just, I think it often, it's a, weird, it's a weird thing, but I think it often strengthens your faith when bad things happen. Which is strange, I know, but it just, you need, you need to lean on God more than you do when think times are good. In terms of just maybe the most basic kind of thinking, will I be healed from cancer and will I be cancer free and live a long, happy, healthy life? I doubt it. I doubt that'll be the case. It's just the science and the evidence is very clear. And I've never heard of any, anyone with cholangiocarcinoma, um, I guess it, having a miraculous healing. Um, but I have faith that it, it could be possible. But I think faith is more important than understanding that this is part of a larger plan and it's not, it's, it's not about me and it's not about, you know, I'm getting punished for something I did in the past or that kind of thing. It's just a much broader, broader play happening kind of on the stage and I'm just one, one character in that and so I have to be able to accept that it's, it's transitory and my, my time might be less and healing uh, may come in different ways that don't include me being around. Um, when you look at like Jesus on the cross, when you look at a crucifix, like, yeah. what, what goes through your mind? Yeah, I think about that quite a bit. It's, it's, it's a good question because it's something on my mind, whether I'm at Mass or with the necklace that I have here. And you think about, okay, I'm, I'm suffering today, I'm tired, I'm having to vomit. Uh, and you think about, this is so much better than, than being crucified and dragging a cross through town and up a hill and, you know, like in front of your own community, like, like that's, that's the worst possible death. Like it, it happened quickly, relatively. So compared to, to compared to cancer or something, so sometimes I kind of joke about that. But the, but the suffering he endured for me is so much worse than anything I'm enduring. And he did it 
intentionally. He, he or he accepted that, like that was part of God's plan for him and, and for him to die for our sins. So I think, okay, he died a much worse death, a horrible death for us and out of, out of a gift of love. And so for me, it's, it helps me endure whatever I'm going through because I know it could be a lot worse and that someone intentionally chose to go through that for us is it's pretty mind-blowing so it, it gives me strength for sure I, but I, I do think about the suffering on the cross a lot do you ever think about the uh, uh, the unfulfilled potential that Chris has I mean if only he wasn't dying uh, what potential look, look at look at all I mean he could uh, uh, he could be do so much if only he wasn't this might sound hard and maybe f hard for people to understand but that's all worthless it's 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 straw right and that might be hard to say because you're like okay well he has young children to raise his children see his children's children and all this sort of stuff and it's like that will all pass away right heaven and earth will pass away but my words will not pass away you know like for him to go and be with god that's the entire goal of our life right his potential is to go be with god his potential isn't to see his children's children a number of my blessings a lot of blessings have come through this process like we wouldn't be here today talking about this um i probably wouldn't be where i'm at i might not have got baptized this year if it wasn't for cancer um, it's brought me closer to my family, for sure. We, we've always been a close family, but it's strengthened those bonds, for sure. It's, and it's, it's given me a lot more focus, I guess, in life, too. So it's, I think it's been a blessing for, for myself and for others around me, too. Um, as much as it's a difficult thing, it's, there's lots of goodness, I guess, you can take out of it. Um, maybe on, like on an individual level, even just suffering... Uh, really helped clarify, I guess, priorities, and it f it, f it focuses you. The reason why is like, um, what am I trying to say here? You know, like God chastises those whom He loves. Well, the reality is, like, when you go and you. Are looking at a young man in a hospital bed struggling for breath it's not easy to say that this is a good thing but in faith knowing what the goal is knowing heaven I think what's good about this is um, what's good about this is Christ what's uh, what's a good death um, I don't know. One that's, you know, I think about medical assistance and dying as an example, and and for me, that's um, not an option for me, and it's it's not so much because the Catholic Church tells you it's not an option for you as a Catholic kind of thing, but it's more about I want my children to know that I fought as long as possible to be with them and to be there for them. And so for me, that's, that's why the medical system in dying just isn't an option, because I want, I want to play it out as long as possible. Um, and I guess, I, I mean, it's hard to define what death is, because is, death, in some ways, I've already been going through a death process in terms of a less energy, I lost my career, um, I lost income. Like, there's just lots of stuff that you know, lost a lot of my social not my social circle, but social life. I just don't have the energy to sustain a social life. Especially with cancer, it's not like a car accident or something like that. It's, it's a long process, um, which I'm thankful for because it, it helps me uh, accept what I'm going through. It helps others accept. But a good death, I, I guess, is just one with honor and um, you, you, you don't feel like you left any stone unturned to, to be there for your family and to support them. And... Um, you feel like you're close with Christ, and ideally ac accepting of it when it comes. There'll be clear signs and symptoms leading up to it. So, 
I guess I can pray and and prepare as best as I can once I know. I mean, the ongoing, but especially once you know that 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 window is there. One of my close friends asked me this exact question. She said, "Like, where can I find you in in years from now if you do pass away?" And I hope through through making this, this creates more accessibility for for me being there. And so I ask the parents, "What name do you give the child?" Lucia Christie. But I have I have almost com almost complete faith. I'm still challenged by it. But that I'll be there with my daughters. Like I'll they can talk to me. They can open up to me. They can ask questions. They can they can pray like and I, I want them to be able to do that wherever wherever they are but there there are a few places in the world for sure that and I've left a list for them of, of my kind of heart and soul places or places that I've had moments of transcendence they can find me in quite a few places but I, I, I really hope they can just find me where they're at Lucia Christie I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit um. All this disappears. We don't live forever here. We're all going to die. And what really matters at the end of it? If you're dying right now, what's the most important? What's going to happen afterwards? Like Father Joby had taught Chris this prayer when he first met him. He said, um, the prayer was, I shall not die, I shall live and proclaim the works of the Lord. And so Chris had said to me, like, JD, how do I do that? Like, I feel like, you know, I'm asking him to help me live, you know, and I feel like I need to proclaim his works and like, how do I do this, you know? And so I was kind of thinking about it. And um, I was actually, I was on Facebook and I saw my, my parents neighbor who I have happened to have on Facebook had shared Chris's story from like a global news article. And then it just like clicked, I'm like, I know how we can proclaim the works of the Lord. God's put it on Chris's heart to do this. Let's do it. And so go in contact with Matthew and let's do this. I, I'm worried that it's a sad story for my kids. I hope and pray about this, that it somehow can be a blessing for them where they can, they can have the resilience and uh, to work through it and it won't be a negative thing for them. But one of the reasons I want to tell the story and be open and candid about it all is because I want others to, to kind of appreciate what they have and appreciate the health that they have, appreciate the moments that they have, and to not take things for granted and to, whether it's putting things off, whether it's like, like the relationship with Christ, or just being engaged with your family, your, with your health. Okay, I, want, I want it to be a happy story for others who can say, whoa, okay, it's a bit of a wake-up call. There's things I want to do, this is a different kind of person I want to be. And you never know when things could, could, could turn on you. So take advantage of that. Thank you.